Hello and welcome to the Heads and Volleys podcast with me, Lee Dunn. I hope that the title of this podcast is what really reeled you into my discussion today and talking about punishments. Punishments, I see them falling under several different categories and there is the kind of classic, you know, be quiet or run. But then also looking at, I see punishment as a pre-practice or a pre-game lap or several laps or sprints around the field. And I also see it as punishments for losing the ball in some sort of activity that results in push-ups or sprints or something silly like that. And then also the idea of a punishment being, if you are good in this practice, if I deem you to have done well, then you will get to scrimmage for the last 20 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever time a, a coach puts on for a scrimmage at the end. So those are the four kind of topics that I want to run through here with my own opinion, of course, and I've definitely done all four of these things and having done them and now considering that I do things differently, I think that you may find some of these here. So the first Part of this will be about the arrival, players arriving at your field for your game, for your training session, and often you see lines of kids running around the field and maybe you make it fun and have the back guy has to sprint to the front and then everybody keeps going and it's a chain and it goes on and on and on. And then I hear of the perspective where coaches say that with the little ones or younger players or maybe even more recreational players, a run calms them down it it gets some of that excitement out of them and I think that is where a lot of this issue lies that players are coming to our training sessions and they're excited they want to be there so why would we not put them in a situation where we are giving them the game straight away I did a blog post a little while ago about the the time it takes to open a game of Fortnite and to actually be in the battle bus or into the game and it took from moment of turning the PlayStation on to getting in was about 60 to 70 seconds to be in the game so then my challenge to you as a coach is how can you get your players playing the game within 60 seconds of arrival and then why wouldn't you do that if kids have this instant world available to them now and without trying to be old or kind of this was you know back in my day but we didn't we if we wanted to find something out or if we wanted to do something we had to have patience whereas now most of our kids will have access to the internet a phone or an alexa in the house and be able to say give me the answer to this same thing is replicable with fortnite you turn on fortnite and you're in the game within a minute So then when kids come to practice, why would we send them for a lap, which we deem to as a way to calm them down? Or even if it is a warm up, when in a game of soccer, do we run at a constant speed in a big circle or a big rectangle? And then you shout at them for cutting the corners anyway. So now we've already started practice off on the wrong foot. Kids kids are coming and now they're having to run around the field. I've said this story before, but I remember coaching on a field, two full size turf fields. There were eight teams on each field, so 16 total. Parking lot was chaos. I was in the back corner, fortunately for me. My kids had to go through the entire field to find me. But they knew that when they got to my practice, we had scrimmages. We set up the goals. They played 2v2, 3v3. And at the time, these were 11, 12, 13-year-old boys. So they come into the practice and now they're running across the field. They're running through other people's sessions, which of course annoys other coaches, but their kids are just running and doing all sorts of physical training anyway. So why not just run straight through it, come to my field, because they know as soon as they get there, they're playing the game. They have an element of excitement. Channel that excitement that usually results in quote unquote disruptive behavior and put it straight into a game. These kids are young, they're pliable, we can add in some dynamic movements when the ball goes out of play and such and build the warm-up from there, but they've already come to practice and now they're already playing. So I encourage you to consider why you send your kids for a lap. Why, Why do they have to go for a run around the field? And if you can't really answer it, or maybe you can answer it, but can you put the kids in a position or a situation where they're being rewarded for what they're arriving for and that sounds kind of silly doesn't it that they're they're being rewarded but it's not about being rewarded really it's about giving them what they're there for they're coming to play soccer well we're going to get them playing soccer straight away 
now my my next biggest peeve in in youth sport and youth soccer especially of course that's my field of my field of love it's be quiet be quiet i'm talking be quiet okay run goal post and back tree and back two laps around the field you two you're messing around four laps around the field while everyone else plays i've done it you've probably done it you probably did it tonight you probably did it yesterday you'll probably do it tomorrow who knows but my challenge to you is to consider why they are messing around. And this kind of spurred from a conversation I had on Twitter recently where the coach's perspective was that the kids need to learn an element of discipline being taught within, within the training environment so we can teach them discipline through our sport. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. But there's, there's lots of ways that I think discipline is misunderstood and this is one of them, that you have to listen as a kid. Think about how the kids have spent the last year to 18 months, really, looking at they've been told what to do. They have to sit and listen at a computer. You know, m- Many of our kids are back in school now, but they spent a long time in front of a computer using Zoom calls where they really had to pay attention. And then just in regular life beyond a pandemic, kids sit in school, they're told what to do, they're told where to go. Their parents likely tell them all sorts of things throughout the day or in the morning, in the evening too. So these kids are told all the time. Then they come to our training. And then if we build on that same perspective, surely the discipline should have been taught by all the other adults in their life that told them where to line up and what to eat and what to do and what to wear and what to put down and what to read or what to talk about. So then why would they come to our training session? And if they're still missing that quote unquote discipline, then surely what we're doing isn't really working. So I encourage you to look at why do kids mess around in your training session? And without blaming you, I'm going to blame you because you may be talking too much. Maybe the training environment is too complex. Maybe it's too simple. It's too easy. It's too hard. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't translate. Maybe it's just boring. And that's a really hard thing to consider that you probably put plenty of time and planning into what that session is going to look like. It may hopefully be a part of a greater periodization plan, but you're now considering that the kids think what you've put all that energy and effort into is boring. And let me ask you, if you have the kids playing in small-sided games that are very simple, maybe with some some fairly simple constraints, such as scoring a goal after dribbling past a player is worth two goals. That's a constraint. Maybe one team has a big goal and the other team has a small goal. There's another constraint. But the game is flowing. The game is simple. The kids understand what's going on. You add time limits to it. And I'll ask you, how many of your players mess around in that type of situation? And I bet the moment you say, stop, everybody come in to me, come on in, here we go, and I'm going to talk to you about something that may have been relative to the game itself, but is now completely removed because you've taken them out of that situation, I'll bet that's where you maybe start getting issues. I'll bet that's maybe where you start having one kid pinch another one or kick another kid's ball away. There's a really good one. If you have younger players and you bring them all together with their balls at their feet, you're just asking for a disaster because they all kick each other's balls away. Even if they've all got the ball one foot on and one finger on their nose and they've got another hand on top of their head so they don't move, they're still going to kick somebody else's ball away. These are the issues that we're creating for ourselves when we bring them in or when we remove them from the situation from which they were just training within. So again, not just be quiet or run, stop messing around or run. Can you reflect on your own practices and what you're doing that may be encouraging these types of behaviors so that you can avoid them? Now, maybe you think, well, we have to teach them discipline. They have to stand there with their ball at their feet. But why? What, what, they're not, what are we teaching them in that moment? Because I bet if you, whatever your ramblings were or whatever your talking points were, If you ask them what that was five minutes later after they've gone back to play, they probably couldn't give you everything that you gave them. And again, even if we say, well, they just have to stand still for 20 seconds. My challenge for you is why? Can you do it in the flow of a practice? Can you do it while they're having a water break? Can you do it in a one-on-one situation? So you take one player out of a small-sided game and talk to that player and then take another one out and then another one out and then another one out. 
There are so many ways that we can challenge these players without putting them in a position where they're likely going to fail our expectations. And that's my ultimate challenge on that one. Can you put them in a position where they're going to succeed? Bringing them in together is always going to fail. It's always going to fail. And I've done it and I know it and I've made kids run and I've made kids sit out and I thought that they were the worst kids on the team or the most annoying and I hated their parents because I hated them. But in hindsight, and of course, you're still going to have kids that will maybe be slightly disruptive, but we're putting them in this position where they're going to have less chance to be that person. They're all playing the game. There's not really much time to mess around. So we don't have to say, stand still, be quiet, don't kick anyone else's ball, don't touch anyone else's ball. We don't have to waste 20, 30, 40, 50 seconds, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Coaches, blood pressure has gone through the roof because we only have an hour of practice and we just spent 10 minutes making the kids run because they're not listening. Maybe we just do it in the flow of the game. So part three, losing the ball results in some form of punishment. It may look like something as if you were playing a 6v2 rondo. And if you connect 10 passes as a team of six, maybe the middle two have to do five jumping jacks. Or if the six on the outside lose the ball, maybe they have to sprint to the fence and back. What are we teaching them in that moment? It's not teaching them to keep the ball, or how to keep the ball. Of course, they understand that they need to keep the ball, but they don't understand how because they just lost it. Maybe in a game, we've removed what is actually happening because we don't very rarely have a 6v2 in a game. We don't really have much opportunity to try and play keep ball from a 6v2. And a typical 6v2 may be just a circle with two in the middle and then we're going to try and play around them and see what happens. But... What are our players really learning there? Maybe we're learning as a two that we can press hard and the other team loses the ball. Yeah, that's that's good. But from a coach's perspective, you've made it a 6v2 so that the six have success at keeping the ball. But have you taught them how to keep the ball? And then again, my own coaching style and philosophy comes out here because I say we don't play 6v2 in a game. We very rarely have an opportunity to play 6v2. So how can you make it look like a game and how can you make it relative? Why would I continue to pass in a circle? I wouldn't do that in a game. If we did that in a game, you as the coach would be losing your mind at us because we're not going to the goal. So why isn't the goal in training? Why aren't we playing a 3v3 to a goal? And if we get to keep the ball and if we connect, perhaps every player on the team touches the ball or we have some sort of constraint that involves an element of possession, but then also a goal too. Now we're connecting the real game with what's actually happening for our players in training to develop for that game. Instead of saying, if you just straight out lose the ball, that's it, you're not good enough, that's not good enough, go and run. And then we have players that have an element of fear. They don't want to run. And there may be many of you listening to this saying, oh, my kids don't mind it. Yeah, they love to run. And I've had the same question asked to players too. When I say, would you rather play a game or would you rather run? And of course, some of the smart ones or maybe just the ones who are so used to running all the time say, oh, I like running coach. Well, players are scared with having the ball at their feet. They don't want to make that mistake. Then we end up in the game of soccer that you probably see on most most youth soccer fields in the United States, which is send the ball long, boot it, chase it. And then we'll take our chances of trying to get to the goal. Because when we were playing 6v2 in training, which of course looks nothing like the game, and we haven't played 6v2 at all in a game, well then we don't want to lose the ball because we have to do push-ups. We have to do some sort of sprint. Then why? Now we're playing a 6v2. We'll carry on with that. The six just lost the ball against the two. If there's one moment where that may be true, it might be in a build-out moment from our goal kick or our goalkeeper just got the ball, played short, 7v7, you have to play short behind the build-out line anyway. So now in this area of the field, we're playing a 6v2, they're pressing with two, that's okay, we'll try and play as a six to get out, maybe even just a five. If we lost the ball in a game in that moment, what would we do? We would press, we'd try and win the ball back, 
and we're going to try and stop our opponent from scoring. Yet in training, our players would just drop what they were doing and sprint to the fence and back or stop and do push-ups. And that's it. That's our, that's our training. So then how are we supposed to teach transition if every time a player loses the ball, they have to do an element of a physical punishment? Why not reward the opponent? So again, take that 6v2. If the two players win the ball, and if you're dead set on playing 6v2 in a circle, if the two players win the ball, why not have them try and connect three passes, four passes? Why not have them try and get out of the circle in possession? And that is worth two goals to them. And then your six have a goal every time they connect 10 passes. And it's the first team, the six or the two, the first team to score five. So you're looking at your six getting 50 passes, or you're looking at the two in the middle getting out two or three times, depending on how you want to work your points out. Now we're teaching an element of transition within the same exercise that we were previously making our kids sprint. And again, we haven't addressed fully what that looks like in terms of teaching them how to keep the ball. Remember, if we were using that real example, 6v2, trying to build out, we would have a goal to attack. We would have a, a reason to move down the field. We wouldn't just stay in the same area. So again, really look at if I'm making my kids do something, am I setting them up to fail? Do I want them to run? Or am I just being lazy by saying, you have to figure this out, and if you don't, I'm going to make you run? And then when you look at the idea of a player getting nutmegged and the ball goes through their legs and they have to drop and do two push-ups, five push-ups, whatever. That's, and I've seen it done in a game. A player drops in a game and starts doing push-ups. And then the coach is screaming, what are you doing? Because you just lost the ball. Now that player is running through on goal. And it's a prime example of that taking from training into a game. Now imagine if we did it with our players where we taught them how to build out, how to transition, how to press the ball properly. Instead of dropping and doing push-ups, they'd be transitioning and pressing the ball and maybe winning it back straight away. And then my final peeve with punishments is the idea that if you do good in this practice whatever this practice is it's typically compiled of drills quote-unquote drills then if you do well if you do good if I perceive you as doing well or perceive you as trying really hard whatever my subjective measurement is then you get to scrimmage and then everything that we've done that I think you needed to do everything that I wanted you to learn this week because it's what we struggled with in the game previously or what I think that we have to work on then it goes into a game and I don't coach it at all. I just let you go and play because it's like a, a free play. Yeah, go ahead, go play. And I think that's where a lot of the issue around using games and teaching games for understanding and small-sided game setups within practices, the whole part, whole type situation, the scrimmage is often, well done, everybody, go play. So when I talk to volunteer coaches, when I talk to any coach and talk about the idea of using scrimmages as the vehicle for teaching what we're trying to teach in various forms, they probably relate to what a scrimmage is in a traditional practice, which is, of course, go play and forget about everything we just did because you worked hard. So now go play when really if we use our training environment to relate the game for what we're trying to teach, then we should be using small-sided games the entire time. At the start, I talked about the, pre, the pre-practice, the pre pre-game laps. Instead of doing that, if the kids came to play, that might be their element of free play within a scrimmage. But even then, as a coach, you can start questioning players on certain things that you're going to begin to address throughout the practice. Players come out and they play a 3v3 for 10 minutes for the start of practice. Then you've got these players playing. Maybe you want to work on breaking pressure with a forward pass because the opponent always presses you. You always seem to lose the ball. Now, every time in these little 3v3 games, you see that behavior where they lose the ball from a press or they make that forward pass and break a press. 
there's an element of reinforcement there. Johnny, that was brilliant. Great work. I love that. Julie, yes, perfect. That's exactly what we want to see. Now our positive feedback is coming into the little 3v3 and the session starts off strong. We have our players understanding or beginning to understand what the focus is. You might even tell them before practice, today our focus is this. You might even tell their parents to tell their kids if they're too young, here is what our practice is. If you're like me and you use tactical pad and you have some older players, send them the tactical pad clip of what is going to be happening in training. Could you imagine giving the players a heads up? Imagine giving them the answers before they come to training. So when they're there, they know exactly what's expected of them. The small-sided games will help you build through what you're trying to teach them because it's relative to the game that they play at the weekend. We can't have players passing back and forth, following some sort of pattern and zigzag and the coach losing his mind because the, the pattern isn't working and kids keep passing the wrong way or keep moving the wrong way. We can't have that and then expect them to go into a game where they have to move where the ball is always moving in unpredictable ways and there is an opponent chasing them down. We can't go from players dribbling around cones, passing back and forth in lines to a game and expect them to be able to retain the information that we taught them. It's a completely different situation. But we can begin that with games throughout the entire practice. Now, part of my role as a technical director is to instill this idea of teaching games for understanding to our players through our coaches. And it's really hard because a lot of our coaches believe in much of what I've just gone through here. So how do I do it? I give them space and I say, here is the game that's going to help you within our identified model. So at 7v7, players have three things in attack. It's to keep the ball with a dribble, it's to pass to feet, and it's to help the player on the ball by creating an overload. Three things from our model in attack. It's so simple. Then three more for defense and in the transition moments. Then we take that and say, here is this week's small-sided game. You train twice, you train three times. We want you to put this into every session if you can one or two sessions, ideally the last session before you play at the weekend. It's a 3v3, it's a 4v4. Here's the goals, here's the setup, here are the bonus goals. Because we don't have kids running if they lose the ball. Same situation, as I said, if the two got it, they break out, They get it's worth two goals. Same sort of thing. Someone passes into feet and that player dribbles and scores, that's worth two goals for our team. Things like that within our training environment. But then I said to the coaches, you can do it for the entire practice. There are here are lots of variations and ways you can build to it. Or you can use it for half of your practice. And then for the other half, you can do what you want to do with your players, what you think is important. But this is all going to be tied into our model and our development. So you still have the freedom to do what you want to do. But we're also going to make sure that these games get put in. And they're not just a scrimmage if you're good. They are a purposeful use of a game that are teaching our players and that's been the biggest culture shift within the mindset of a lot of coaches who probably grew up in the same way and were given scrimmages as as a reward for good behavior where the coach kind of stood back and said great and that's my session done so really focusing on getting these scrimmages into the core of our practices but scrimmages with constraints and then as the practice moves on, we begin to remove those constraints, but still hold the players to the standard of the session. We're still looking to dribble past players. We're still looking to pass into feet. We're still looking to create overloads. Whatever the topic is, we're still trying to do that as much as possible. It's not just free play. It's not just, okay, great, go ahead and play. So you might feel a little differently about the classification of punishments. For me, of course, Anything that we're asking the kids to do or making them do as a result of something that we could have perhaps had control over and maybe impacted differently. Of course, it doesn't mean that's going to work every time, but I'm working on creating an environment for our players to be the best that they can be. If you follow me for a while now, you know that that's my personal goal, my personal philosophy. 
for every kid to be the best that they can be. Part of that comes with the environment I create for them. I'm not making them run. I'm not making them listen, stand still and listen. These are kids that want to play, so I'm going to empower them with playing. That takes a lot to kind of let go of, kind of letting go of that power almost, you know. Kids, go play. Kids, go and have fun. I'm going to facilitate you having fun and learning and not just me giving you all of these answers or making you, expecting you to be an adult and stand still and listen. I want to know what you think. What do you think of punishments? I don't want to know, or I don't want you to feel as though you need to justify what you do. You do what you do. I just encourage you to think about the players more than thinking about the way you do things. Because if you were taught with a scrimmage at the end is good, you probably do the same thing now with your players. And I wonder if they would like to play it in another way. Maybe we as coaches need to do a better job at considering how we can create the environment for our players to succeed the most. And a lot of that, I think, it comes into a game situation. We're teaching them the game within the game, teaching them elements of the game, moments of the game in a training environment so that when they get on the field, it's not so alien to them. It's not so different. It's not so uncertain. When we have them lining up and and standing still and listening to coach talks, 30 seconds or more is too much. And then we wonder why they get on the field and they just kick the ball away. Or we wonder why maybe players start dropping away because they can't maintain the the expectation of their coach. Stand still, play well, do well, don't mess up, or you do push-ups or you do sprints. And I'm not saying that it's it's a standard that happens in every single training session, but it happens. And I want you to try and think a little bit differently. You can always find me at Lee Dunn Soccer. I want to know what you think. I want to know if this has perhaps changed your opinion. Maybe you start doing something a little differently. Or maybe you do something for a reason that helps you get control of a situation. And that's totally understandable. It is what it is. But again, think about our players. Think about our players becoming players. We teach them to play. Bye, bye.